So welcome to the seminar today. So today's speaker is Thomas Schretz. Thomas is an expert on neutrino physics and specifically global fits to neutrino oscillations. He is very well known for that. But today he will be talking about a different topic. Um, it's about misaligned alpha dark matter and misaligned density fluctuations. Okay, thank you very much. So it's a pleasure uh, to give this seminar. I've never been to Sydney. I hope I can do this at some point, but actually I've never been to Australia. So that's uh, the advantage that now I can give seminars easily all around the globe. Okay, so um, I will talk today about this project which uh, we've done in collaboration with uh, uh, people here at Karlsruhe with, uh, and in collaboration with people from Heidelberg, as we just uh, said, and it's mostly based on these three papers here, what I will talk about today. So here is, is the outline. I start with a general introduction and then discuss uh, the axion-like particle dark matter and the misalignment mechanism, which will be the, the topic of my talk. And then I will uh, um, mention that there are so-called isocurvature perturbations in this scenario, and in particular in the case when the patrick Quinn symmetry happens after inflation. And this is uh, what we essentially pointed out, that uh, the pre-inflationary uh, isocurvature constraints are well known since many years, but we pointed out also in that case this can be interesting. And then we did some uh, cosmological data analysis to use this effect and to constrain the parameter space of this dark matter model. And then maybe in, if there is time, I will uh, mention how this fits in the context of uh, inflation model. Okay, just as a brief introduction, we have uh, our two standard models. Uh, the, the standard model of particle physics describing the microscopic world, and then the, the standard model of cosmology uh, describing the cosmos as a whole. And these are uh, extremely successful models. Both of them work very well to describe uh, all our observations. Now, here in the cosmological model, there is, of course, this postulate of dark matter and dark energy. I will focus today on the dark matter part, uh, which uh, 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 is a kind of a puzzle and we don't know really what it is. And this will be the topic of my talk today. So I guess you're all very familiar with that. Uh, you have seen rotation curves and bullet cluster many times. Let me just uh, stress uh, one thing that it's really, a, dark matter is really an essential ingredient in our cosmology. So we have this beautiful data of the cosmic microwave background and the large scale structure, which uh, we can describe very well, but this really works only if there is dark matter and all those features which we are seeing here, we are seeing here these beautiful oscillations at, uh, which have an origin when the universe was 300,000 years old and we're seeing the same oscillations essentially in the distribution of the galaxies uh, when the universe is billions of years old and they beautifully matched together. And in fact, the universe would look very different if there was no dark matter. I mean, the, there is no way to have this, these patterns if there is not this dark matter component. And also the large scale structure would look very different. So the structure formation, we can understand only if we postulate uh, this dark matter component. Now, what is it? I mean, what we do in cosmology is essentially we postulate this, uh, this cosmic fluid which contributes to the energy density of the universe. And the properties are simply that it has no pressure and it has no sound speed. This is how we define dark matter in cosmology. And then there is one single parameter in our model, which is, which is essentially the density of that component. And this is measured uh, very precisely, essentially, from the data shown in the previous slide. And uh, OK, to describe this in, in, a, in a consistent way, we have to make an ansatz for the stress energy tensor, which you put in, in the Einstein equations. And it's very easy to, to have such a fluid. And one way to do it is assume non-interacting, non-relativistic particle. 
this behaves precisely as the, uh, the, the component I mentioned. Another way is a non-interacting classical scalar field. In, in the limit that the mass of that scalar field is much larger than the expansion rate of the universe, this also behaves like this pressureless fluid. And so these are essentially the, the, the most straightforward ways to implement uh, such a component in the universe. So just as a side remark, I mean, the scalar field in the opposite regime, when the mass is much smaller than the expansion rate, this works also for dark energy. But uh, today I will be interested in this regime too. Now, apart from that, we don't know anything about dark matter. And if we take those two possibilities, the mass of this particle can be anywhere ranging from 10 to the minus 30 GeV up to very high masses. Uh, 10 to the nearly 60 GeV. And so it's a vast range of parameter space open. And uh, so we need to understand really what's going on here. This is a real uh, problem. Actually, in my talk, I will focus here on this lower, lower part of this allowed parameter. Now, this is uh, essentially how far cosmology goes. Now, of course, we want to do a little bit better. We want to do what the Nobel Committee calls physical cosmology. We want to have a, a consistent embedding of the, of the theory, a link between the fundamental theory of particle physics and cosmology. We want to understand really what's going on here. And so we want to have a consistent embedding in the, in the let's say, in our uh, fundamental theory, quantum field theory, gauge theory, understand dark matter stability, and so on. And we want also to understand the mechanism how dark matter is produced, really to have a consistent link uh, between the, those pictures. And so this is the kind of the motivation of, of this talk. I will adopt the classical scalar field hypothesis, which I mentioned. And I call these axion-like particles in this case. And in this scenario, we have a mechanism to understand really how dark matter is produced, which is the, the realignment mechanism. And so this is kind of the motivation about this dark matter candidate, which I will uh, assume in this talk. Okay, so let me briefly uh, introduce this, uh, this, this mechanism, axion-like particles, ALPS. So what is the main idea? So we assume that there is a global symmetry, a global U1 symmetry, which is uh, spontaneously broken at the scale, at the high energy scale Fa, which is called Patrick Quinn scale. Uh, and our dark matter candidate is the, is the Goldstone boson of this, uh, of this U1. Um, there will be uh, an, also an explicit breaking of the U1 at some energy scale lambda by, by some new physics, which I will leave unspecified. And this gives the mass to the, to the Goldstone boson. So we have a pseudo Goldstone boson due to this explicit energy breaking. Um, a, a very general answer for the potential which is responsible for this explicit breaking is this periodic potential, which takes into account that the, the, the Goldstone boson is a phase. And so then we can hypothesize that there is this um, uh, periodic potential, which generates then the mass of the, um, of the, uh, of the Goldstone boson. Um, so what we will do is, uh, we will be model independent here. We will assume that the mass of the axion-like particle has some temperature dependence, uh, essentially a power law. And we parameterize uh, this with this potential that the, this index n will be a, a, a power law. And uh, so our, our parameters to describe this scenario is the symmetry breaking scale Fa. It is the, the zero temperature mass of the axion and then these coefficients b and n. So essentially we have four parameters to describe our model. And just as an example, a well-known example for such a particle is the QCD axion. 
and the, the axial is obtained by, by putting this energy scale to a typical QCD scale of about 100 MeV. And then the, in QCD, these parameters set the value of 10 and 4, uh, which in this case follows from the dynamics of QCD. In, in, I will be modeling dependent and keep those as a free parameter. And now what happens in the cosmology of such a scenario is that, I mean, when the, when the Patrick Queen scale is broken, we have this typical uh, uh, Mexican head. Uh, at the high energy scale, uh, the, the axion lives in the, uh, at the bottom of this potential. And as long as there is no explicit breaking, this potential is flat. But at some point, namely around this energy scale lambda, the potential is generated, which means the axion here sees, starts seeing a potential, and then it starts oscillating here in the potential, and these oscillations behave exactly like the dark matter. So this is the scalar field dark matter, which I mentioned, and this is the, the uh, well-known misalignment mechanism. Okay, just as a, to be clear here, in the, in the case of the QCD axion, as I mentioned, this energy scale is fixed by QCD. So there is only one free parameter, which you can choose either the mass or the Patrick Quinn symmetry breaking scale. Uh, in our case, we will be uh, more general and, and take them independent. So actually now we have two free parameters, the, the mass and the energy breaking scale are independent parameters of the model, but in fact, we can use the requirement that this particle is dark matter to fix one of them. Actually, we will fix FA uh, by requiring for a given mass, we will fix the breaking scale by assuming that this particle is all of dark matter in the universe. And so then again, we get rid of, of one of the, those parameters. Okay, uh, this is also well known, I mean, the, the cosmological evolution is described by, by this equation. So uh, theta is now our angular field, which, uh, which describes uh, our axion-like particle. And this is essentially the klein gordon equation in the expanding universe. So this term here is the expansion rate. This is the Hubble parameter, described, which acts like a friction. Otherwise, this is a, just a harmonic oscillator, and uh, this is the frequency, which is, which is essentially the, uh, the energy of the, of the scalar field. So this is the momentum, the, the uh, redshifting momentum. This is the mass. So we have an oscillator with a damping term because of the uh, expansion of the universe. And uh, we see that, uh, in the regime where the expansion dominates over that term, over the, the, the frequency, when the expansion rate is much larger than the frequency, then uh, the, it's a, a solution theta equal constant is a solution of that equation, which means it's an overdamped oscillator and the field is frozen at some value. But then when the modes, we say the modes enter inside the horizon, meaning that the frequency becomes larger than the expansion rate, then it's a damped oscillator. So this is what we're seeing here. Uh, here is as a function of the temperature, this field. At, at high temperature, the expansion rate uh, dominates, so the, the, the field is frozen. And then at some point when, uh, when the expansion rate becomes equal to the mass, uh, the, we, we, the oscillation start. And here we're seeing just the damped oscillations. The damping is just because the red shifting, uh, uh, the red shift, and uh, these are the oscillations which behave like dark matter. Okay, so now we can estimate the, the energy density stored in this field. And of course, um, the, the amount of energy which is stored here depends on the amplitude of the oscillations, which is essentially, so here I fixed this initial condition to one, but this of course sets the amplitude of the oscillations, which is the initial misalignment angle. So if we go back to this picture here, of course, 
the more energy is stored, the, the larger is the amplitude of the oscillations. And so this is set by the initial angle which, from which the oscillations start. So there is the energy density will be proportional to this additional misalignment angle. Now, so we have to specify the initial conditions. And so these initial conditions depend crucially on whether this Petri Quinn symmetry breaking happens before or after inflation. Now, uh, uh, in the pre-inflationary scenario, when the, when the Petri Quinn symmetry breaking happens before uh, the end of the inflation, so we have, have a situation which is depicted here. So of course, when the, when the Petri Quinn symmetry is broken, the phase will have a random value. It runs down on an arbitrary direction in the Mexican potential. So the phase will be random. And here is a illustration of this random, random phase. But then if inflation happens afterwards, a tiny spot of this picture here will be inflated and will become all the observable universe. And so in this case, there is a unique value for this initial angle. And this, the field has the same initial angle in all the observable universe. Now, in, in this talk, I will mostly focus on the opposite case when the Petri Quinn symmetry breaking happens after inflation. And then actually the observable universe contains many of these random patterns. And so we're seeing here this random distribution of the initial field all over the, um, uh, the universe. And so we have, have the situation described here so that the, the axiom field take random values in, in regions which are causally disconnected. And so we have these complicated situations. Now, uh, the, the, the fact is that this is a periodic field. And so in this case, we can have these cosmic streams. No? And so there are those locations where if you go around the circle, the field moves from minus pi to pi. And in those locations, there is a cosmic stream. No? For instance, here we have this situation. So here there is a cosmic stream. Now, what, what happens is when, when the universe evolves, we have this complicated network of strings and those strings uh, evolve. And there is this so-called Hippel mechanism, which uh, is, leads to the following situation that we have roughly approximately one string per Hubble volume. And while the universe expands, more regions become in causal contact, which makes the, the strings to rearrange itself. The field gets homogenized within the horizon. And this leads to the fact that during the expansion of the universe, roughly one string remains per Hubble volume. This remains true until the, the field oscillation starts. And when the, when the, the field os oscillation starts, the, the strings resolve. And so we can, as our con initial conditions, we have before oscillation start, we have an initial condition, roughly one string per Hubble volume, and an average value of the field uh, just set by pi square over three, which is a flat distribution from minus pi to pi. And this is the, the average value. Okay, I mentioned that this is really an active area of research to simulate this complicated process. Here are a few papers where this uh, process is simulated uh, by uh, lattice calculations essentially to, to simulate this, uh, the evolvement of the strings and when the onset of oscillations. So we are making some uh, ansatz to describe this, uh, this behavior analytically. So the main assumption is essentially that the axion field is smooth on scales smaller than the horizon, but uncorrelated on scales which are larger than the horizon. Uh, and this situation can be described with this ansatz for the, for the power spectrum of the field. So this, the, the correlator uh, of the field, we, we make the ansatz that this is a, has a Gaussian behavior. Uh, it, and this is essentially flat for scales uh, smaller than this capital K, 
and exponentially suppressed for larger scales. Now, this, is, this describes precisely this situation where the scale, the transition scale, is set by the size of the horizon. So here it's a co-moving horizon uh, when, when the field starts oscillating. Now, this, this is precisely the, the, the power spectrum which describes this, uh, this uh, situation. And the normalization is fixed just by assuming that the field is completely random between uh, minus pi and pi. Okay, now with these answers for the power spectrum, we can calculate the energy density. Okay, I will not go through the details here. So there is the energy density of a scalar field. We plug in the, uh, the answers for our power spectrum, and then we get the simple expression for the energy density in terms of the, the field modes, which are described by the power spectrum. And so this is a slightly better um, calculation than this naive estimate. Now I have shown here this estimate for the energy density, which is proportional to the misalignment angle. With our formalism, we have a slightly better um, uh, estimate here by taking into account the contribution of the different momentum modes, which we get here by this integral here, but essentially it's the same physics as by this uh, uh, well-known estimate. Okay, now, as I said, we can, if we fix the energy density to the dark matter density, then we can uh, fix the, the petri quinn breaking scale. Also here I show as a function of the axion mass the uh, petri quinn breaking scale which gives you the correct uh, dark matter abundance. And so the different lines here corresponds to different temperature dependence. So remember, this is the ansatz which we make for the temperature dependence. And we will see this index N in all my plots. And so depending on this temperature dependence, we will have slightly different relation between the mass and the pressure between breaking scale. Now, just for reference, I show here also the QCD axion. For the QCD axion, the relation between the mass and the petri quinn symmetry scale is fixed. So th this is not a free parameter. They have to sit on this line here. And uh, here is the well-known uh, sweet spot for the QCD axion, where the QCD axion gives you the correct dark matter abundance. And so this is the 10 to the minus 5 electron volt QCD axion where you satisfy the QCD relation and you get the correct dark matter abundance. Now, as I said, I will not confine myself to this region. I will be model independent and I will confine myself to these lines here, which give us the correct dark matter abundance and uh, giving up the QCD relation. Well, as a matter of fact, I will extend this plot here to the very far end, to the low masses here. So now I, I show you the same plot, but for very small masses. So I, I will go and extend to the very end of our huge range for the dark matter particle mass and go in this range of 10 to the minus 20 electron volt. And you see here, these are the curves which uh, give us the correct dark matter abundance. Now, let me just briefly comment here on what determines the edge of this parameter range. So there are limits. Why can't we make the dark matter mass even smaller? This has to do with the structure formation because for those extremely tiny values, the, the Compton wavelengths of the particle becomes astronomical. And actually for 10 to the minus 21, it becomes of the size of a dwarf galaxy. And if it's even smaller, we would not be able to, to to build uh, dwarf galaxies out of those particles because the de Broglie wavelength would be too large and so we would not fit in the, in the dwarf galaxy and this sets a, a rather robust lower limit of 10 to the minus 21. Okay, there are some slightly more model dependent bounds. Uh, this uh, requires some assumptions on what happens to this field. I mean there are uh, there is this uh, possibility that there are these solitonic cores which form and form the survival of, uh, of astronomical objects 
we can set a slightly stronger lower lower bound, which is, however, uh, somewhat more model dependent. There are also li limits coming from black hole super radiance, essentially uh, from the fact that we are seeing rotating black holes. If such light particles exist, you can build a cloud around the black hole and then extract angular momentum from the black hole. And uh, this is, would be then in disagreement with the fact that we are seeing rotating black holes, and so we can set bounds here. Well, as a matter of fact, those bounds do not apply in our scenario because they somehow uh, disappear if the uh, patrick Green breaking scale becomes too low. And it turns out that this is slightly lower uh, for the patrick Green breaking scales, which give us the correct dark matter abundance. These limits already disappear because to the uh, self-interaction. So actually those bounds will not apply uh, in, in our scenario here, but uh, those limits here will set the, the lower range of the parameter space. Okay, by the way, so if there is any question, please interrupt me. It, it's uh, to have, uh, it's much nicer not only speaking to my screen. If you please interrupt me at any time, you, you want to ask a question. Okay, this was the energy density. Now we can also consider the, the density fluctuations. So with our ansatz for the power spectrum, we can also calculate the, the, the fluctuations in the energy density. Uh, and okay, this is some math. There's some algebra using weak theorem and so on. And then we can, we can get a, a relatively simple expression of the energy density power spectrum as a function of our exponential power spectrum, which encodes our random field in, in the beginning. Uh, let me just show you the result. So essentially this, uh, this flat power spectrum uh, will show up in the, in the fluctuations of the energy density. So this is the, this is the power spectrum shown as a function of the, of the wave number. Here is the dimensionless power spectrum. And so what we see is this dimensionless power spectrum becomes of order one when at a scale which corresponds to the horizon when the field starts oscillating. So this is how we normalize our momentum modes here. We normalize the momentum to the, to the horizon when the field starts oscillating. And so we have this order one fluctuations which have the typical size of the horizon when the field starts oscillating. So these are the famous mini clusters. So these are order one density fluctuations. They will start collapsing by gravity, and this leads to these uh, uh, gravitationally bound structures, which are called uh, mini clusters. Now, in fact, I will not, this is an interesting topic, but this is not the regime I'm interested in. Actually, I will be interested in much smaller uh, wave numbers or much larger scales where the momentum is flat. So I will focus here on this tail where we have the white noise power spectrum. And this white noise comes really from the, from the very simple physics that causally disconnected regions are uncorrelated. So this is the origin of the white noise power spectrum, which means actually that the dimensionless power spectrum scales like uh, uh, the third power of k, and we, we can make this very simple answer that for scales which are su sufficiently small compared to this uh, horizon scale, we have this uh, dimensionless power spectrum goes like you know, third power of k. And for those modes, we will make this answer, and um, uh, this will lead to the, the observable effects I'm interested in. The normalization here, this coefficient c, okay, this depends essentially uh, uh, to have order one fluctuations at the horizon scale. There is some uncertainty here. We parameterize, this will be essentially our systematic uncertainties and we consider some range here for this normalization coefficient c, which we obtain by comparing it to some numerical simulations. 
But the important thing is the shape. I mean, this white noise shape is very robust, and this will be the main signature of, uh, of uh, which we are interested in here. Okay, now maybe just as a brief reminder for people who are not familiar with this cosmology uh, terminology, in cosmology, uh, there is this distinction between adiabatic and isocurvature fluctuations. And uh, let me just remind you what this means. So we have the total density contrast in the universe and for each component which is present. So I here labels the dark matter, the baryons and the photons. And for each of the components, we can define the density fluctuations. So this is the, the delta is the deviation from the mean uh, density. And for each component, we can define such fluctuations. And then we can decompose the fluctuations in this adiabatic and the isocurvature component by just uh, splitting them. This is a trivial linear uh, split. And the definition, if you want, is that the adiabatic component is proportional to the fluctuations of the photons. So the, the component which is proportional to the, to the photons we call adiabatic and everything else we call uh, isocurvature fluctuations. So there, never mind this factor 3 over 4, this has to do something with the initial conditions. And, uh, uh, but then uh, essentially what's happening is that the adiabatic component is just all fluctuations in all fluids are proportional to each other, whereas the isocurvature component are the independent fluctuations of the different fluid. And the important thing is that in the cosmological evolutions, the adiabatic and the isocurvature components evolve differently. And in fact, the data is consistent only with the adiabatic component. So the data tells us that in cosmology, all fluctuations are aligned with each other and that they are, we can put constraints of a few percent on this uh, ice curvature component. Well, actually, this is what they call the misaligned uh, fluctuations, no? because the, the fluctuations are, have, are misaligned between the, the photons and, and the dark matter. Now, of course, those fluctuations which I've discussed here, they are misaligned. No? They don't know about the photons. This mechanism is completely unrelated to what's happened in the photon fluid. And so those fluctuations here are of the isocurvature type. That's, uh, that's the important thing. And by, the, by this constraint, this means that they cannot be larger than a few, few percent of CMP scales. And so we can constrain the, the amplitude of those fluctuations. Okay, maybe just as a, uh, as a remark, so in the pre-inflationary pre case, there are also isocurvature uh, fluctuations, essentially because both the inflaton field and the axon field are present simultaneously during inflation. And this also leads to isocurvature fluctuations. This is well known, started since very long time, since the early 90s. And this leads to important constraints from isocurvature in the pre-inflationary scenario. So this is not what I'm discussing here. I'm, what we pointed out essentially also in the post-inflationary case, those isocurvature components are uh, interesting and can give relevant constraints. And for some reason, this was not uh, discussed uh, so far, contrary to the pre-inflationary case. Okay, so let's come back to the post-inflationary scenario. So what is, the, what is the situation here? So we have, of course, also the adiabatic component. So this is the adiabatic power spectrum, which comes from inflation. This is the usual uh, lambda CDM um, adiabatic uh, power spectrum, which is responsible for, for setting the seeds for, flutter, for structure formations. And now on top, this is the, the, the famous scale-free uh, Harris and Seldovich spectrum. And now on top of this spectrum, we have the isocurvature component, which has the white noise power spectrum. So this has a very different spectral shape and it's much more, it has much more power 
on, on uh, small scales, on large scale modes, which meaning small scales. And so there will be a transition point where the isocurvature component dominates the fluctuations. And uh, um, for, for, uh, for small scales, we have the adiabatic uh, domination and for large scale, uh, we have uh, this um, uh, isocurvature component. And so here is the, 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 the capital K, which is the, the, the horizon size when the field starts oscillating. And so we see that uh, this capital K sets the amplitude of this uh, component. Now the amplitude, you remember, which I had before, the amplitude goes with the third power of the, the, the capital K. So the horizon, when the field starts oscillating, fixes the amplitude of this component. So what we do now is the following. We assume a dark, a dark matter mass. So the dark matter mass will fix the temperature when it starts oscillating. And so then we know the horizon when the field starts oscillating. So here is, is the, the size of the horizon when the field starts oscillating as a function of the dark matter mass. And so once we specify the mass and the temperature dependence, we know the horizon when it starts oscillating. This means we know the, size, the, 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 the amplitude of the isocurvature component. And so then we know essentially the transition point when, uh, when it dominates. So what we do now is we specify a reference scale, K star, which we take as a typical scale for CMB observations. And then we know the ratio between the adiabatic and the isocurvature component at that scale. So this ratio is, is essentially our parameter. We call this F iso. And the ratio, the, the ratio of the isocurvature and the adiabatic power spectrum, uh, this is our, our parameter, which we want to constrain. And it's, it's fixed really just by this horizon when the field starts oscillating. So this, uh, uh, so in turn, if we specify the mass, we can calculate k, and with k we can calculate f iso. So we know this ratio, and now we can use cosmological data to constrain uh, this, this component here. Okay, uh, I just emphasize again here that the spectral shape is fixed. You know? So in, uh, in, uh, of course, many people are looking for this isocurvature component and then usually it has some assumptions about the spectral shape. Then the interesting thing in this model here is that the spectral shape is just fixed. It has uh, this white noise uh, spectrum. Uh, it's not a free parameter here. We have only the normalization which we, which, which we constrain. Okay, so here is this plot. It shows the, the isocurvature fraction as a function of dark matter mass. And we see, okay, now we see that we really have to go to this lower range of the masses. In this case, in this case if we are at, at around 10 to the minus 19, depending on the temperature dependence, we will get isocurvature components of order one or 10%, 1%. So this is the, the range. And typically CMB limits are in that range. We can constrain it somewhere at the percent level. And so we can expect to set limits here on, on for, for those very light dark matter masses. Okay, so here is uh, what, what will happen. So this is the CMB uh, power spectrum, and this is the, the, the lambda CDM case with, without an isocurvature component. And we see if we switch on the isocurvature component, we will get here a contribution which is most important at, at high L. Uh, and I mean, the reason is clear you know, that this we have here this blue tilted component, so it will show up at, at high K. And so this, this effect will, will show up first at uh, uh, high momentum modes, so large L will, will, is, is the effect where we will see the effect. So here is the, the effect on the power spectrum. Again, if we switch on the isocurvature component, we will modify here the, the, um, the small scales or the large K uh, 
uh, where, where we will get a, a contribution from the isocurvature component. Uh, okay, I'll come back to that later. So what we did is now in collaboration with the uh, cosmologists from Heidelberg that we, we just took cosmology data and did a, a data analysis using uh, Planck CMV data, uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations, and then uh, galaxy cluster abundance. And uh, what we do is we uh, assume the lambda CDM model, including neutrino mass, which we keep fixed, and extend it with one free parameter, which is our F ISO. This is the ISO curvature component, which will be uh, one parameter extension. And then we can use those data to constrain uh, this, uh, this parameter. And so let me show the, the results. So here is the, uh, the posterior likelihood uh, for this F ISO parameter using Planck CMB data and uh, BIO acoustic oscillations. So interestingly, this data shows some slight preference for a non-zero value of this isocurvature component. So this was a, a little bit surprising. This is roughly at the level of three sigma. Uh, so here we are showing the residuals of the CMB Planck data. Uh, to be honest, I really don't see it why uh, the red data points speak better than the black ones, but uh, uh, okay, apparently this is what uh, the, uh, comes out of the fit. There seems to be this uh, slight preference. We also checked that this is some, somehow specific to the spectral shape. So what we did here as a cross check is now we allow the spectral shape of the isocurvature component to be free. So this is the, uh, the power, the spectral index of the isocurvature component. Our model predicts n iso equal four. So n, the definition here is that four means white noise power spectrum. And uh, it turns out actually that uh, this, this data here seems to prefer precisely this white noise component. And then we get here this slight preference for a non-zero value of S uh, of F iso. Now, this is not consistent if we, we use the data from large scale structure. So if we now include uh, 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 this uh, additional data coming from uh, CMB uh, lensing and also this cluster abundances, uh, we, the, there is no preference for non-zero F ISO. And uh, okay, the, the combined data set, if we do all data combined, uh, ISO curvature component zero is consistent at the 95% confidence level. So here you have all the, uh, the results. Uh, this is the large scale structure data, which show no preference and sets an, an upper limit. And here is the, the combination. So this is consistent uh, with zero, and we see also here well, uh, the delta chi square is uh, well not very significant. So that's why uh, we did not get too excited about this uh, preference here, and especially the combination. There is no no really significant for a non-zero component here, and I think the conservative uh, thing to do is to use this as an upper bound on the isocurvature. Okay, now we can uh, go here through this, uh, this modeling. We have an upper bound. If you have an upper bound on the isocurvature component, we get an upper bound here. So this means we can exclude uh, these low masses. So we set a lower bound on the dark matter mass. And this is what comes out here. So this is uh, shown a lower bound on the dark matter mass. Uh, assuming an upper bound on the isocurvature component for different temperature uh, dependent masses. So we can exclude here these, uh, these lower, very low values and depending on the temperature dependence, uh, we can set a significant bound here. Uh, remember the Lyman alpha bound was some, somewhere here at 10 to the minus 21. So we can constrain here this uh, lower mass region. 
Okay, this is just for fun. I mean, if we would uh, observe really a positive uh, uh, isocurvature component, th then this plot shows that we could really determine the, the uh, dark matter mass. So I think this is just for illustration. If at some point we have a statistical significant indication for such an isocurvature component, we could really fix the, the dark matter mass uh, under the assumption of a certain uh, temperature dependence. Okay, uh, maybe we did also some sensitivity forecast for future, for, for, for future cosmological observations. Uh, for, for instance, a stage four CMP experiment, uh, 21 centimeter observations, uh, uh, assuming some uh, uh, SKA uh, configurations. And uh, we see that uh, with those uh, um, data, we can really have a significant improvement, maybe up to more than one order of magnitude in this isocurvature component. So this is, will be very interesting in the future. We did also here some estimates uh, from, from the large scale structure. We assumed some Euclid uh, large scale structure survey and included uh, weak lensing, cosmic shear, and galaxy clustering information. Uh, in addition to CMB lensing from a, a future stage four CMB experiment. Now, uh, an important thing here is the problem of the nonlinearities. Okay, maybe I mentioned this briefly because as I, as I said, the, the, the main effect will be here at, uh, at small scales or large uh, momentum modes. And this is precisely the, the regime where uh, non-linear clustering effects become important. So the, the difference between the dashed and the solid lines, so the dashed lines is the prediction of the linear perturbation theory and uh, the solid lines are the calculations uh, assuming some, uh, some modeling of the non-linearities. So the effect is large at, at, at those scales here and this is precisely where the isocurvature uh, has, has most of the effect. And so it is important to understand the nonlinear modeling here. So what we did here is we assumed a, a cutoff scale here for modes which we take into account in the analysis. And, and what we see is that this is the sensitivity to the isocurvature component. And we see that the, the sensitivity strongly depends on how far we go. So let's, we consider, we, we just consider here two benchmark cases. Now, a, a conservative assumption is that we consider modes only less than 0 0.05 inverse megaparsec, which essentially means that we take only the data to the left of this curve here, where non-linearities are, are modest and uh, maybe we understand the evolution here good enough so that we can trust this simulation. Now, if we would are more aggressive and take modes into account up to 0 0.2, then the limit would improve uh, drastically. And we see that this has really a strong uh, effect on, on, on the limit, how far we trust the um, uh, nonlinear modeling of the, of the evolution. Okay, so here, this summarizes uh, this sensitivity forecast. So this is the current limit coming from, from Planck data, and the, the current limit we have now. And this would be a future uh, CMB observation. This would be 21 centimeter observations, SKA. And these are the large scale structure observations, the conservative one with the, the cutoff at 0 0.5 inverse megaparsec. And this would be the aggressive one. And you see this has really a, a huge potential, uh, some orders of magnitude improvement. And we can set corresponding uh, strong limits here. So here, again, I show the lower bounds on the limits, which we can obtain. And we see we can really push deep into this uh, parameter range here. Okay, maybe I, I should mention also this analysis here. So after our first paper, there, there was this group performing a similar analysis using 
uh, different cosmological data. So they used reionization data and Lyman alpha forest uh, data, and they obtain quite strong bounds already with present data from those um, uh, from those observations. So, of course, we were also thinking of Lyman alpha because clearly Lyman alpha tests the large K, and so this is uh, seems to be a sensitive probe. So we didn't dare to use them because of the non-linearities. But uh, I mean, if we trust this analysis and uh, assume that non-linearities can be modeled in this regime, you see that this gives very competitive uh, limits here, and we can set here very interesting bounds on the on the on the alt mass uh, comparable to these future large-scale structure uh, observations. Okay, maybe. If I still have three minutes, I want to say a little bit uh, about inflation. So do we, do we still have, have yeah, time? Yeah, you still have three minutes, that's the time. Okay. So, as I, I said, of course, a crucial assumption in our scenario is that uh, patchy green symmetry breaking happens after inflation. So the, the patchy green symmetry breaking has to be broken after the end of inflation or it have to, has to restore it after inflation and uh, the actual the condition is that the Patrick Quinn symmetry breaking scale has to be uh, less than either the Gibbons Hawking temperature which is essentially the expansion rate during inflation or it has to be less than the maximal temperature of the universe so, okay, this energy scale here, this is the energy scale of inflation, which is related by the Friedman equation to the, to the expansion rate. Uh, and so this, uh, there is this efficiency parameter. So this tells us how much of the energy stored in the inflaton gets transferred to the thermal bus, to the uh, temperature of the, let's say, the, 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 the radiation dominated universe. So this would be the maximal temperature of the universe. And so the patchy green symmetry breaking scale has to be less than either of those, the maximum of, of those two, that our bounds apply. You know, then, then we are in the post-inflationary scenario. Now we are seeing in this regime where our limits are, we are at these small masses, we have typically relatively high patchy green breaking scales so this means we need relatively high scale of inflation. Now, uh, in fact, in, in generic models of inflation, there is an upper bound coming from the non-observation of tensor modes in CMB. And this upper bound is at the level of 10 to the 16 GeV. So we are seeing, so this is comparable to the patchy wind breaking scales we are at in here. And so we see that uh, to satisfy our, this requirement, we need some kind of high scale inflation models where the, the energy scale is at the, at the scale of 10 to the 16, such that we can be below this uh, patchy green breaking scale. So this I've tried to, uh, to summarize here. So what is shown in those plots is the, the mass, the, the, the alt mass, the, the axiom like particle mass. And here is the scale of inflation. This is the energy scale of inflation. We have here the upper bound from tensor mode, which is at, at 10, 10 to the 16. And uh, so the black curve here is the transition between the, the post-inflationary and the pre-inflationary scenario. So in, if we are above this diagonal line here, we are in the post-inflationary case. And here, our isocurvature bounds apply. And these are the red regions here. So this red region is excluded by, by our limits. The blue region are the pre-inflationary isocurvature bounds, which I mentioned before, and which apply, of course, below the diagonal line. And uh, so we see the nice complementarity of, of our bounds and, uh, and the, the previous known bounds here. And uh, so, of course, they constrain different regions here in this parameter space. And so the three panels here are for different de temperature dependencies of the, ma of the axion mass. So this is for uh, no temperature dependence. This is n equal 4, and this is a strong temperature dependence. And so we see here that our bounds 
are relevant, first of all, for high scales of inflation, where we, are, we live here, and they are relevant if there is a significant temperature dependence of the axial mass, then these bounds are really relevant. And we need also some efficient reheating. Also, this efficiency parameter has to be of order one. This is, has to be as assumed for this solid curve. If the efficiency is low and the efficiency of 10%, then we are here at dashed curve. And uh, then again, uh, there is a small parameter space where our bounds apply. But here is a, a future bound. So in the case we have the Euclid uh, survey, then we can set uh, interesting bounds even here. So then the, the, red, the red region would be everything to the left of this curve. And then we can even have uh, interesting bounds here in this case. Okay, this is all I want to say. Uh, I think, so this is, uh, I will not read you the summary, but what we considered is the, the isocurvature uh, constraints can give interesting limits also in the post-inflationary scenario. This is what we pointed out. It's because of this uh, causality range and we can set uh, interesting lower limits on the, on the axial mass. And while we expect significant improvement really from future cosmological data here to this um, uh, data. Okay, and uh, maybe as a final remark, so this is one example where we have a purely gravitational effect, which is directly linked to the dark matter production mechanism. So it's really the misalignment mechanism, which we're testing here. And so from the motivation, which I started with to, to take the production mechanism as motivation, this is an example where we have really observational effects directly linked to the production mechanism of dark matter. Okay, thank you very much. I, I close here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thomas, for a very clear talk. So we have time for questions. Um, who wants to go first? So we have, you can either speak up or raise your hand. Oh, can I ask the question first? Uh, yeah. There is no questions from, from others. Um, uh, Thomas, first of all, thank you, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, uh, my question is related to the fact that why do you need this particle to be a uh, Goldstone-like particle? What is the motivation for this? I mean, is that because you want to keep mass under control or you know, because it looks like to me at this point, when it's cut off completely from the particle physics, it can be just a uh, light particle, and that's it, without any relation between F and M. Yes, that's correct. I mean, essentially, uh, well, the only thing is we need this particle to be very light. And it's an, uh, if it's a goldstone, there is a nice reason for that. Otherwise, uh, this is not required. Um, yeah, that's correct. I mean, uh, essentially, the, we have the n equals zero case. Now, the n equals zero case means no temperature dependence of the mass. And if you want, you if you just put a particle which has that mass, then you essentially have this n equals zero. You just have the bare mass, which is there, every, independent of of temperature. And this is, uh, if you want, then there is nothing left from the goldstone uh, nature. Yes, this is not an essential uh, assumption. So another thing, uh, may I ask another question, Michael? Yeah, sure. So, uh, what is that temperature dependence? Because it looks like to me this this guy is not in equilibrium with the rest of the things, isn't it? Yes, um, that's correct. I mean, okay, this, it's really an analogy to QCD. So let me, okay, let me go back to the beginning where I have this slide. Well, in QCD, you have those interactions with, with the rest, right? And at some point, well. Exactly. So, I mean, let's say the, the basic idea is, I mean, how to, to model such a potential is that you can have 
some strongly interacting sector we, where non perturbative effects will uh, come into play, and this will lead uh, to the generation of such a potential, which then will be temperature dependent. I mean, in the example of, of the QCD action, it is really the QCD dynamics. You know? so, and here, the temperature dependence comes from the dynamics happening in this non perturbative sector which in this case is QCD. So that's where the temperature dependence comes here. Yes, so in principle, you have to assume some, some extra interaction beyond the gravity in, in principle. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it could be a completely hidden sector. That's... Yes, it could be a, a completely hidden non perturbative sector, and uh, which may have a different temperature than the temperature of the photons. But, yeah. uh, um, Okay, we are we are agnostic about that, and as I said, N, we, we also consider N equals zero, which means bare mass, constant mass, every, everywhere. Uh, yeah, but this is kind of the, the implicit assumptions we have in the back of the mind if we consider a non-zero. Thank you. Um, can I ask one thing about so um, so you had the. Um, you said it, reheating has to be very efficient, such that it's best that you start really with some temperature there. But what, did you think about what would happen if reheating wouldn't be as efficient and if basically the oscillation starts kind of during reheating and, and how it would affect those predictions for isocurvature perturbations? Yes. So, I mean, then essentially our limits would not apply. And that's the, uh, that's the point because it's difficult to satisfy uh, <clears throat> to have to have the Patrick Queen symmetry breaking uh, after inflation. Mm -hmm. But, but means, would it completely go... rule it out, or would it basically just say, okay, you have to modify uh, the analysis slightly, or kind of? Uh, well, it would, it would it would not rule it out, but. The, the, the limits will not be uh, relevant here. No? So what's happening is that, okay, let's take the dash curve here. So then we can have a post inflation scenario only if we live here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this means that, means that the, the axial mass has to be larger somewhat. And larger axial mass simply means that the isocurvature fluctuations are very small. Okay. So and then they are then they are too small and then the, there are no relevant constraints. Mm -hmm. no, that's uh, that's what happened. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, I was always under the impression that isocurvature modes decay once you once the a scale enters the horizon. So normally, if you see like you know some power spectrum plot, you will have the isocurvature spectrum going down with L. Okay, so I'm a bit surprised that your spectrum is pretty flat, and then it even has some, you know, it even rises up again at large k values. Am I missing something? Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, like, like basically, like, like for me, you know, you, you start with isocurvature, but in large scale structure, people rarely worry about it because basically everything becomes adiabatic once your sub horizon. Okay, maybe this is seen this plot here because okay this shows the the evolution of the isocurvature component as a function of redshift so we're seeing here at high at high redshift is this blue curve here yeah. and uh, what we're seeing here is what happens if the mode enters the horizon no? i think this moving moving of these features here is is when it, when 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 the mode enters the horizon, and actually this is what we are what we are seeing here. I mean, this is okay. Of course, also the uh, the adiabatic one moves, grows, but the the isocurvature grows different. So this, I think. Yeah, but but it's growing with it's larger at large k value k values, and this is not dimensionless power spectrum. If you multiply this by k cubed, this is sort of crazily large amount of power on small scales. Okay. Yes. And I don't know, it's just a bit contrary to how I usually understand isocurvature modes. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I should read your paper. 
Yeah, but, well, I think this is the future because it's really this very blue tilted. I mean, it, okay, it's, it's it's because of your assumption of a blue tilt. But, yeah. but I, I just remember you talk, talked about white noise, and um, and I would I mean at at these scales I wouldn't be looking at scales at the, at the time of the QCD epoch. These are, these two, these, two, these scales are too large. So I'll be so so those scales will no, be no. out of the horizon at the time of the QC, of the QCD phase transition. No, but for our scenarios, it's not at the QCD con, uh, transition. It's oh, much okay. Which, whichever. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, okay, so I think maybe what we're seeing here is really that this is much steeper than the, the usual adiabatic one. No? So this means ns equal four. White noise means ns four. So but white noise is in the is a dimensionless power spectrum, right? Not no, no, in no. The, not in the power. The spectrum. dimensionless is the blue curve. No. Well, this, you mean the scale three? It's well, you, you have P of K, and um, if it's white noise, it's flat in uh, in in delta square. So K cubed times P K. If you have a flat line, it's white noise, right? No, it's flat in P. What is shown here is P, mm -hmm. which means K cubed in delta, right? Okay, maybe I'm not mis maybe I'm misunderstanding some notation somehow. Okay. Yeah, because there are like ten different ways of defining a power spectrum, and I get confused sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Can't hear you, Archul. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah. I think uh, I think it's over four five. So we, uh, Joe, I see your hand, but I think we close the official thing. Stop recording.